in this kind of general introduction to land cover mapping and land change, um, this is going to be short. I'm going to cover some basic things um, and then get in a, we'll be able to look at some uh, actual land cover data. But before we get started, it's really important that we understand that what we see very much depends on the interaction uh, between our sensory physiology and the phenomena out there in the, in the material world. And a really good example of this is if we are looking at just a few seconds of, uh, of starlight on a winter's night, as you might see here in New England, and we see there's Orion's Belt, very common feature in the northern winter sky. Um, this is what we see because our eyes uh, are set up to have our retinas fire after very little light uh, impinges on it. If we instead consider looking at this uh, same sky scene and, and gather 40 hours of this starlight, all sorts of very large objects start appearing in the sky. Uh, they're very faint but they're out there. It's uh, the, you need to constantly be reminded of how our sensory perception structures what we see and what we don't see or feel or smell or, and, and so on. So there's lots of things out there. We can think, you know, sometimes uh, astronomers talk about Telescopes as light buckets that gather the start light and over long periods of time to reveal those faint objects. And so we can think about Earth observing sensors as gathering and integrating three types of light arising from our planetary surface. What we're most familiar with is, is sunlight, reflected sunlight. That's what, we, um, that's what our visual system depends on. Uh, but we're also, we sense... Uh, Earth light or the emitted terrestrial radiation, how warm the environment is in a variety of ways. We sense that through our skin. And then there's another type of, of light arising from the planetary surface, and that's human light that's coming from, you know, these are, whether this is um, the lighting, not lightning, but the lighting we have at the surface. I'm sure you've all seen night light images. Gas flares, fishing fleets are all are using lights at night and we can very much uh, see those from space. But also, getting into more technical things, we can look at the backscattering from active sensors, whether those are imaging radars or LIDARs. Here we're going to be, uh, talk today, we're going to be focusing on this um, sunlight and, and earth light. Another important understanding here is that not all uh, wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation or light are able to pass through the atmosphere. We are, here we have on the um, on the y-axis, atmospheric opacity, 100%, nothing gets through, 0%, everything gets through. And there's four major atmospheric windows that enable this terrestrial remote sensing from space looking through the atmosphere to see things on the surface. The visible to near infrared, a lambda here is the symbol for wavelength. So this area right in here, you, moving from uh, indigo into red, into the far red, into the near infrared. That's the NIR, near infrared. The short wave infrared right next to it. The thermal infrared, and we're familiar with thermal infrared, seeing thermal infrared from, uh, for example, uh, night vision goggles and, and things like that. And then there's a, uh, another very important uh, window here in microwaves. Um, you may not uh, know it, but each of you are emitting a few photons of microwaves. And when we look at across a very large area, um, and we can actually see uh, the microwave flux coming from the Earth through the surface and learn lots of things, particularly about the moisture of the surface. And one more piece that I want to point out is there's this big chunk of an atmospheric window spanning wavelengths from about 5 centimeters to 10 meters uh, that enables both our terrestrial communications, uh, whether that those are a cell or radio or, or television, 
and also enables radio astronomy. So we have uh, these windows are very important for us to not only understand what's going on, on the surface of the Earth, but what is happening um, out in uh, the uh, outside of the Earth and, and the rest of the universe. At the same time, we are very fortunate that all of those high uh, energy waves that are um, at wavelengths shorter than uh, the visible, uh, our atmosphere protects us from those. Otherwise, uh, it would be very difficult to have life on Earth. The shorter the wavelength, the more energetic uh, the energy. The other important thing to understand is that what we sample from space is just of tiny fractions of the reflected solar and emitted uh, radiation budget. So only about 4% of the incident solar radiation is, is going back into space where we can observe it. And it's about 6% of the, of the Earth, um, uh, Earth's radiation that we can sense uh, from space as well. When we're looking whether at a short wave, particularly short wave, but also long wave, uh, we're looking at a passive sensing where we have a sense source of illumination that is illuminating the target, and we have a sensor that is viewing the target. So we're looking at that uh, either reflected sunlight or the emitted longer wave uh, Earth light. And that sensor may be on a satellite. It could be uh, in an airborne, it could be an airborne sensor, it could be a drone, a UAS. It could either even be a fixed camera. Now, the closer the surface it is, the less atmosphere is, is a problem but we can't see uh, through clouds uh, in either the, the short wave or the long wave. When we go all the way out to the microwaves, we can see through the clouds. If we are looking at the, the visible, the near infrared and the short wave infrared, here are some idealized spectra of different materials. So the objects at the land surface appear differently as a result of the illumination conditions the day of year, the time of day, the atmospheric conditions, is it hazy, is it clear, is it cloudy? It's cloudy, we can't see the surface, but also the viewing geometry. What, what's the, the sun angle uh, relative to the surface? Uh, where is the sensor relative to the, uh, the sun? And also, as you've all experienced, um, the, what would technically be called the bi-directional reflections distribution function if you stand looking at a, a nice green lawn with the sun behind you, you get a very different color of the lawn than if you stand uh, such that the lawn is between you and the sun. The color, one of the reasons the color is different is because you're not only getting reflected light, you're also getting light that is transmitted through the canopy. But those are two very different, um, very different views of... of uh, of the canopy. The colors are quite different. So these are some idealized spectra and it's important to know it's from these idealized spectra that we see areas where they are different. We're going to be able to use that information to be able to, to say, well, that's soil versus vegetation. At the same time, we see areas where they overlap right here around uh, 740 uh, nanometers. It's very difficult to distinguish soil from healthy green vegetation. But if you move off in, in either direction, it's, it's actually not so difficult. Green vegetation appears green because it is, it is reflecting about somewhere about 15 to 20 percent of the incident sunlight, but it's absorbing more blue, it's absorbing more red. But notice it reflects an enormous amount about 40% of the near infrared. And it's this big difference that enables us between the reflectance at, at uh, about uh, 680 and reflectance uh, you know, just beyond uh, 800 uh, nanometers that we can see vegetated areas from space. Now, of course, if, we, if our eyes could see in the near infrared, we would need to be wearing uh, we would need to be wearing sunglasses all the time, looking at 40% of the sunlight being reflected back. It would be very, very bright. 
Another in, important thing here is that water uh, is not detected in the near infrared and the shortwave infrared because of the uh, all of it, all of that energy is absorbed by the water and it's not reflected back. Here's some actual spectra so you give an idea of, of what um, real as opposed to ideal spectra are. Uh, this this one here where we have a little dip that's going to be in an area of the sand where there's a little bit of green that's absorbing that red in there. And you can see a little bit of absorption there as well, but very little uh, in the way of green. A lot of these other ones, we see the green bump, more blue and uh, more bl uh, uh, red absorption, and then this near-infrared ledge. I want to take a step back because I heard that you also, uh, and one of the topics that were, was of interest in this was uh, uh, urban heat islands. Um, so there's a, a more generalized uh, thing to think about here. Planck's law describes the relationship between the spectral density of light or the, how the, the light appears, what's the color of the spectrum uh, that's emitted from a black body, which is a convenient uh, fiction of uh, physics from as a function of temperature. And so what we see in this graphic is the, the, the Planck curves for, at this, uh, in this instance, various suns of different temperatures. A red giant might be 3,500. Our sun is a little bit, high, a little bit more than 5,500 Kelvin. And a black body is a, both a perfect absorber and a perfect emitter. Materials in uh, basically any massy object in the, in the universe is not a black body. It doesn't act like a black body, but this makes the, the math go well. And there's a very simple distillation of Planck's law that's kind of fun. And we can, Wien's displacement law can give us the, the wavelength of the maximum amount of black body emission as a function, very simple function of temperature. So there's this proportionality constant, and we just need to plug in uh, the temperature of the object in Kelvin, and so we get something like this. Wien's displacement law, where we can look at the coldest temperature recorded on Earth, it's about a negative 128, and that gives us about, uh, about 15 and a half uh, microns in terms of wavelength. That's part of the thermal infrared as we're moving up through basically anything that's happening on Earth in, in kind of human temperatures, it's all in the thermal infrared. If we look at freshly ejected volcanic lava, it's a lot hotter. It's about 1,700 uh, Kelvin. Uh, so that we're now into the short, uh, the short wave infrared. The, the warm LED lights that we are now you know, putting in in our houses uh, give a nice uh, kind of uh, yellowy uh, lemony light. It's about 300 uh, Kelvin, but it's the maximum amount of, of light that it's, it's putting out is actually in the near infrared, so they have to uh, do some filtering. The nearest red giant to us uh, is actually in the Southern Cross. It's Gamma Crucis. So our eyes sense the light, but we actually have thermal uh, receptors in our skin to uh, sense the heat. Of course, we navigate through this, uh, this radiation environment uh, using both of those things quite importantly. Here are some key missions and sensors for land cover mapping and change analysis. Uh, the different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that they're sensitive to, their spatial resolutions and temporal repeats, and who uh, runs these satellites. And, and today, um, we're going to primarily look at Landsat and, and Proba V. Proba V is from, from Europe. Um, MODIS is a coarser resolution um, satellite that, that uh, lots of people have done, uh, uh, have worked with for many years. This sensor, however, both of the sensors um, will, within the next uh, 24 months, no longer be in, uh, be in operation, and there's follow-on sensors instead. Uh, here's kind of the uh, NASA's Earth-observing constellation. Um, 
Landsat 8 and Landsat 7. Uh, Landsat 7 um, will, will be uh, retired once Landsat 9, which is going to be launched late next year, uh, is successfully up in orbit. MODIS on Terra and MODIS on Aqua um, have been very important in the past two decades to understand the planet and to map uh, the land cover as well as lots of other things. Interestingly, there's lots of sensors on the International Space Station uh, as well, some of which are very useful for uh, land cover mapping. So uh, to get back to looking at land surface temperature, we can use the, the spaceborne uh, spectro radiometers to measure this, this Earth light uh, in the thermal infrared to estimate what the land surface temperature is across a large area. And so urban heat islands arise from the slower thermal inertia of the built environment in contrast to the, uh, the vegetated rural areas. And the important thing in this is that urban heat islands really come out at night. You know, there is some difference during the day, but it's particularly at night that those differences uh, arise. So both landscapes are absorbing sunlight during the day, but the vegetation in the rural areas uh, cools down much more quickly than all of the uh, built environment. And so heat is retained and emitted more slowly in the, in the built environment, and so things appear hot. And that's in addition to uh, whatever heating may be going on. Uh, so it, this first image we're looking at, at both daytime and nighttime images across a very large portion of the country, and we see that there is areas that are cooler and areas that are warmer, and there is a very clear north to south gradient, but there's also, you see, a east to west gradient as well. If we only look at the nighttime data, this you know, things look different. Uh, the distribution of those hot spots is, is uh, substantially different from the previous image. And if we zoom in to an area we're more or less familiar with, uh, we see uh, both the, the lower peninsula and around Lake Michigan, uh, all of the uh, urbanization in, in the Chicago area. But we also see lots and lots of inland waters throughout here. But again, the north to south uh, environment. Now here, we are only looking at the daytime data, the daytime thermal data. And all, there's not that, that same amount of contrast. Um, there is contrast, particularly areas that are uh, more heavily vegetated. But at the same time, the contrast between the, uh, the riparian areas that came out at, uh, in the nighttime Im image um, are not there. And then here is, again, uh, the zoom version of the daytime and the nighttime. So pretty much any of those areas that are intensely red blotches, that's where you're going to be getting uh, urban heat islands. So to, to move from um, observations, whoops, of uh, surface reflectance to a classified map requires linking clusters of similar spectral and, and or temporal characteristics in a high dimensional data space with the labels associated with land cover categories. So what does that mean? Well, if you're, you're taking one image that might have multiple spectral bands or many, many images through time with those spectral bands, each of those, uh, each of those spectral bands at each point in time is a different dimension within which you can uh, map your data. And while it's you know, way beyond our ability to, to kind of keep all of those things in, in mind and think in 15-dimensional you know, space, computers can do that quite easily. And so we do linking the observations to labels, the, the classification step can be, can be done using algorithms that, that either require training data for known land cover types you know, so we, we look at the spectra and characteristics, uh, temporal characteristics, for particularly uh, particular land cover types, and then uh, tell the, uh, the computer, this is what 
this kind of land cover looks like, find other instances of this. And this would be a supervised, supervised classification. Or you can look at, um, or you can look at uh, unsupervised classification, which is simply uh, using the statistical characteristics of these clusters, and they, it labels them, and then it's then the human needs to then go in and say, do these clusters then correspond? to the land cover classes that I'm interested in. And both of these approaches are species of machine learning. And I found this uh, pretty interesting uh, diagram here uh, about uh, uh, machine learning that really gives us some good examples uh, of supervised versus unsupervised learning. So in the pre-categorized data, if we're trying to classify things, or you, know, you could think of that as dividing socks by color, well, you can also work in looking at classes through regression techniques uh, that we might do to be able to divide ties by length. And what's our objective? Trying to come up with predictive models. This set of characteristics then maps to this label. That's what the supervised learning does. So then the unsupervised learning, what it's trying to do ultimately is get at, at uh, structure recognition or pattern recognition by looking at uh, clustering, as I said here, dividing by similarity, association dividing sequences that make sense, or dimensionality reduction, where you have a whole bunch of data and you're trying to um, reduce it to so a few number, uh, a few number of characteristics that are uh, that capture that big structure. So, uh, if we think about this. Um, it's the classification on the one side, and then we have this clustering on the other side uh, in the land cover mapping, and then there's the additional step after the clustering of associating it with uh, land cover categories. So these things, uh, the, the land cover mapping involves some kind of mapping of the surface. So there's any thematic division of the planetary surface into a manageable number of discrete classes has to make assumptions about what can be observed and what is important. And so each land cover classification, the legend of each land cover classification, really indicates what the producers consider critical to their representation of land surface. And that really very much depends on the problem at hand. So uh, what I'm showing you here are four examples from uh, the, the Proba V uh, classification by uh, uh, using a probe of bead data by the European uh, Space Agency's Copernicus project. So on the, the right hand, uh, left hand side, we see the mapping um, of the region here using a single forest class. Uh, and, and that's in green. And then in pink, we have croplands. And in red, we have uh, urban areas. And then there's a couple other uh, land covers in there, including inland waters. Um, the next one over, there's actually many, many forest classes that they're, they're getting at. And so now that single green is broken up into lots of different greens. On uh, the other two, what we see is instead of you know, saying within this pixel, there's just this class, we can uh, use some other techniques to be able to estimate what the amount of land cover is within each pixel. This, this particular product uh, provides a spatial resolution of 100 meters. Uh, so as you can imagine, within 100 meters, there's lots of different patches that, that may, be, may be relevant. Uh, so these techniques uh, estimate what the, the fractional land cover is. Uh, so you're not just looking at the dominant or the majority but uh, various fractions, whether it's urban built up or fractional cropland or, or any other uh, class. So how people came up with these classes uh, in the U.S., uh, four years after the launch of Landsat 1 in 1972, there is this uh, important paper published by USGS that, that uh, came out with a system to do land cover mapping, land use and land cover mapping using remote sensing data. And their level one, the Anderson level one classification has just nine different categories. And these nine 
are um, you know, trying to look across the entire United States and having um, a sufficient uh, number to be able to break things up, but at the same time, uh, not make it too complicated. Well, today, things are, are a little more sophisticated. The USGS's National Land Cover Database it gives 30 meter resolution, 16 classes, and these are based on what we call the modified Anderson Level 2 classification. So within developed, you have four categories. There's open space, uh, low intensity, medium intensity, and high intensity develop. You could collapse all of these into a single developed category. That would be level one, or you can break it out in level two. And you can see different uh, forest categories. But there's also four categories that incur occur only in Alaska. Dwarf scrub, lichens, moss, and sedge herbaceous. So if we are looking at the, uh, the, the map of the conterminous U.S., uh, we would only see 12 classes. In contrast, uh, Copernicus in Europe, they're much more interested in lots of different types of forest. And so they have uh, in their 23 discrete classes, most of them are actually forest types. And there's very little discrimination. You know, this is basically um, very very fine parsing of the forest structure at, uh, uh, attached to an Anderson level one classification with some other interesting things uh, thrown on. And, and this land cover uh, category categories are uh, functional at um, 100 meters. So how to conduct a change analysis, the preferred approach, among the many options, really depends upon the question at hand, but a, the real straightforward approach that is not without problems is to, is to conduct a post-classification analysis where two or more images are cross-tabulated to indicate changes in, um, changes in um, categories that occurred between type 1 and type 2, but this presumes that you have crisp categories and that there's an absence of uncertainty in each classification step, and that the, labor, the label category applies to all of the area in the pixel. So it presumes that there are no other uh, land cover categories within that pixel. Uh, so the USGS has approached this change analysis uh, simply by indicating pixels that they have found changed, but Copernicus... Um, has his uh, approach has been to transition uh, to map this transition to land change processes, for example, urbanization, deforestation, land abandonment, and and this is you know, really much more a way that's tuned in by how users think about uh, getting at land cover uh, and land use change. So here are a couple of links to current products. Um, we have, for example, uh, the Copernicus uh, land cover site. I want to show you that briefly for the viewer, uh, but there's also the viewer for the national land cover uh, set. This is something you can, you can um, directly get into and, and play around with. Um, and we can, for example, look at the United States here as a single land cover class for 2015. We could shift it to 2019, and we get a different result, slightly, not kind of hard to tell. If we look at all the different uh, forest types, then many different things um, start to pop into place. We can zoom in here a little bit and look at fractional covers. Here's fractional forest. Fractional herbaceous or or, uh, or grasslands, uh, with the legend here over on the lower right hand corner, are built up, fractional built up, and permanent inland water and seasonal inland water. It's kind of more interesting to zoom in a little bit more and see how those those two things change. 
And then we can also look at land cover changes. Um, the challenge to a large extent here is that um, we can see there's some pixels that are turned on. Well, the land cover change doesn't change hugely at, at a 100 meter resolution year to year, uh, but it does. And we can actually look at uh, annual change. We can accumulate the change and pull in a little bit more. But we see that there are some changes. Now, are these actual changes? Well, there's a lot of uncertainty associated with any of these mapping products. Um, and so when you're looking at very little spots here, um, you know, this is more suggesting what's going on than actually uh, giving you a, a definitive uh, response. And so here is something very comparable for um, the USGS product, the finer, finer spatial resolution, but there are fewer, um, you know, this is the 2016 data. Uh, we can shift then down to the 2013 data or all the way to the 2001 data. And yeah, it's kind of hard, unless you really zoom in, uh, it's not easy to, to see the differences. Here's the land cover change index. Again, you really have to zoom in to start seeing you know, where those changes are. Um, they also have a tree canopy uh, product, which is um, rather interesting. And there is um, a, an impervious surface product that really gets at um, the amount of built up area. There's the descriptor, and then this is the impervious surface. So in each of those data sets, you could actually go in and uh, download the data uh, and be able to, to work with it and explore different parts of the world uh, and, and pull things in to your heart's content. You know, we can do, for example, uh, Kyrgyzstan and look at what the fractional cover of uh, you know, permanent inland waters are, or grasslands, or forests. Not a lot of forests in Kyrgyzstan. Um, and there are statistics associated with those as well. You can actually uh, view the land cover uh, statistics um, and compare them and, and and do all sorts of uh, different things, but not with the fraction cover. We actually have to go into a land cover category, Kyrgyzstan, and then see. So interesting um, resources that are available that actually now uh, require uh, basically access uh, to a browser uh, and and patience, because it takes time to, to to learn what the particular website can offer. Thank you.